I'm going to hopefully deliver a sermon this morning that I first intended to deliver last Sunday afternoon and decided after I got here I'd preach on something else, which I think I told you then would be rather brief. But it seems to me and did at that time that people who are faithfully serving God and undergo the problems that are characteristic of all of us here need some comfort and some strength, some encouragement, some edification, especially dealing with the idea of losing things here and our hope of eternal life and the full expectation of our glorification when this world is over and we're raised eternally on that morning bright and fair. So I chose to do that. This is the sermon that I would have preached then. I think it, of course, as I try to with all my lessons, choose that which is important to all of us. And today, if Satan is speaking to anybody, he's speaking to the young people. I want you to think about it just for a moment. Young people just don't have a whole lot going for them when it comes to our culture and our society and religion. But more than that, even the homes, if they may be called homes. And it's been working that way for a long, long time. It just gets worse because we compound the problem over and over again. But it doesn't change the will of heaven regarding what ought to be done and the godly homes God expects to exist. Now this may sound strange, but as an expedient, and I underscore the word expedient, it could be that it might be best not even to marry rather than get yourself into some situations that you get yourself into. Paul even said at the point that he was writing to the Corinthians concerning that present distress for the church that at that time it was better. He handled it as an expedient. It was better to be single, to be as I am. When you get married, you have great obligations placed on your shoulders as a husband and wife that when you're not married, you don't. Now, I'm speaking to people who are truly believing in Matthew 6, and all other verses and emphasize that God should come first in every thought, word, and action. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. But before we ever get to the stage with young people that they're thinking about a mate, we need to be aware of all that goes on within a home and that God charges parents to do to be what they ought to be, to discharge their obligations as parents to their children. Any student of the Bible is certainly aware of the many, many verses that pertain to young people. One of those questions that really is quite a haunting question, our scripture, is found in 2 Samuel 18 and verse 32. Remember when David, King David, asked about his son, Absalom, is the young man safe? That ought to be applied to the spiritual aspects of a young person. Is the young man safe? Is the young man woman safe. Solomon wrote later about the course of true wisdom and we're all familiar with it. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. Now I'm speaking to young people here this morning in particular. You have the responsibility to remember God in your formative years. To do what's necessary to create a stronger love and faith in God and godly things and to set your affections on things above and not on things on this earth. 
He says, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. All that's saying is this. You're going to follow a course of action that most of the time is set when you're a young person. When you're forming good or bad habits. Have you ever wondered why it is that young people are the ones that mostly respond to the gospel call and obedience to it? Why don't you see more even 20-year-old, 30, 40, 50, 60. I think in my preaching as far as visible obedience as an alien sinner, the oldest that I ever was involved in was in a gospel meeting in Arkansas. The man responded to the invitation, and if I remember right, he was about 66 years old. That's just almost unheard of. Why? Why? Because we form habits we form views and we do it in our youth and what's wrong with forming good habits of bible study of learning how to worship god of conducting yourself before your peers in a godly manner of living the christian life early you remember that Timothy was blessed by having the will of God instilled in him from very early life. Paul could say, from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. Now let me ask some of our young people, can that be said of you that from a child at this stage that you're studying the Scriptures, to know them because they're God's Word and you want to live by them because they will judge you someday. They will read and mean then how they read and mean now. From a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. 2 Timothy 3.15 Why people want to be wise concerning so many things. There are folks that are wise concerning football and baseball and Oh my, there are people that are wise on all sorts of video games. All sorts of things like that. Uh, they wouldn't know how to live if they could get involved in those things. Well, what do they know about the Bible? What do they know about the scriptures? Uh, there they're lacking. He was challenged by the great apostle Paul when he was told this. Let no man despise thy youth. And he says, but be thou an example. 1 Timothy 4, 12. You can't be an example if you don't have a pattern to follow. That pattern is the word of God. Learning how to study it. Learning how to rightly divide the word of truth. Making your life so that studying the Bible daily is a part of it. And you feel like something is completely left out if you didn't get to study your Bible that day. Even so, concerning prayer. It is a necessary part of your daily existence on this earth. Make it that way. Set the example or pattern of godliness before the people. I remember as a late teenager and all through my 20s, I especially was mindful of this verse. Because, frankly, when you're a preacher and you're preaching on about every topic that you can think of as far as the Bible's concerned, then you have a lot of older folks who are saying, well, what do you know about marriage? What do you know about young people? What do you know about raising children? As if you've got to experience a thing before you can know God's will about it. Well, I grant you that being involved in it and having experience produces a great deal of wisdom. <clears throat> but only then if you're applying the truth while you live it and solving it as the truth guides you to do so. Well, people were no different in that day and time. We know how Paul felt about Timothy. He said, I have no man like-minded. So he could trust that when he sent Timothy somewhere, things would be done as it ought to be done. So he says, let no man despise thy youth. Well, how do you do that? How does a young person, 13, 14, 15, 16, and Timothy probably was in his 20s, how does he do that? He lives like the word of the living God tells him to live. 
He makes sure that he shows forth Christ living in him by being obedient to the truth. Let no man. That's something you must do. Don't allow, don't permit any man to despise you because you're simply young in years. Show them that young people can know what the Bible says, that they can study it, they can pray, and they can live godly lives. And thus they become a pattern for everybody else. You know, as you're a young person, especially in your teen years, you, you try to want to impress other people. You want to be accepted in the group. That's just part of it. Now, truth of the matter is, all people never get out of that, that temptation. We, we all like to be accepted. But it's especially tempting when you're a younger person in those formative years. And why not just decide that I'm going to live like the Bible says, which is going to put you in a position contrary to most of the people you're around because they hardly know how to spell Bible and their parents probably not much better off if they are any better off. So it's going to take a great conviction on your part, a great determination, a great resolve to paddle the boat upstream and not drift because most everybody's going the other way. People in general like the easy way, the way of acceptance. But you choose the way of God, and that's going to cause you to paddle upstream. <laughs> you don't just go with the current. So you resolve in your heart that I'm going to serve God. I don't care what anybody else thinks. There is a tremendous problem among young people saying, well, what do people think about me? How do people look at what I wear? You need to be concerned about what the Bible teaches and what it tells you to do. And here's what you need to do. Don't give a purple monkey for what people think about you. I don't think you'll find a purple monkey anywhere. So you <laughs> just don't care. Care about what God thinks about you. And you'll have a full-time job. The thrilling message of Psalm 127, verse 3, is lo, children are a heritage of the Lord. A perceptive poet told the truth in these sentiments when he says, the soul of a child is the loveliest flower that grows in the garden of God. Tis a plant that is tender and wondrously rare. The sweet, wistful soul of a child. You pass that through that state of life once, then you change. You'll never be that way again. Anybody needs to know that should be godly parents. Get one chance with your children. One. As far as that formative years and doing what you need to do as the Bible teaches in parenting them. In Ephesians 6, 1 through 4, we have a wonderful statement by Paul to the church in Ephesus pertaining to children and the importance and the beauty, really, of obedience. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment, with promise. That it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. There's a wonderful statement concerning children being obedient. Now, you understand nowadays that rebellion is on the part of most children. In fact, if you read through the book of Proverbs, you'll see it's a part of growing up that hits all of them. At one time or another, there can be more rebellion on the part of a child than others. They may show up in different ways. Part of it is them developing and growing into a grown person, an adult. But when they learn obedience at home, it makes all the difference in the world how they will be when they're grown up, how they will look at things. 
how they'll be responsible in government and in the neighborhood, and how they'll be when they become husband and wife and father and mother. Someone told me one time that parent uh, that being a parent begins generations ago because it builds. You build on whatever it is that has come down through the family. It's the reason that when the family becomes just a thing we talk about in our homes are nothing more than filling stations, places to sleep. The people aren't trained and taught. They don't learn obedience. If anything, they learn to fight with their parents more than anything else. I don't think any language supersedes the hearty refrain of what is found in Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 26 in reflecting on the love of parents. I don't think you can say any better than this. My son, give me thine heart. Just think of how few words that is, but what it's really saying. Give me your inner man. My son, give me thine heart. Parents like those of John the baptizer had blessed mankind. Look at what it said in Luke 1, 6 of John's parents. They were both righteous, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. What a statement. I'd just like that on your tombstone for all to see until the end of time. And if it was there, would it be true? In Zechariah 2 and verse 4, we read, Run, speak to the young man. You better run because he'll not be a young man very long. Or a young woman, as the case may be. That's another way of saying what I was talking about a while ago. They're not babies very long. They're not little children very long. They're not even teenagers very long. I think there are four, I'm sure there are more than this, but at least four basic lessons that all young people need to hear if they're going, well, if they'll just slow down and listen and give proper attention, honest attention to them. First of all, we've already talked on in general, and that is be spiritually minded. Romans 6 and verse 6, the old man's crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Remember the passage, remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. When you obey the gospel, that's what you're trying to do. The way of the world is put away from you. You begin to make choices that lead you closer to the Bible, the study of it, the practice of it. What you ought to be is a boy or a girl, later a man or a woman. Allowing the crucified Savior, is what it amounts to, through his word and our obedience to it, to dominate our lives. And that's going to create an example that is everlastingly good. As the poet said, it may reach like widening ripples down a long eternity. To be spiritually minded is, according to the Bible, life and peace. That's the message of Romans 8 and verse 6. But now if when the cares and riches of this life Choke out your interest in the Bible, you're interested in godly things, then we can't expect to bear the fruit God expects us to bear. Luke 8, verse 14. So be spiritually minded. That's your responsibility. That is, if heaven is to be your home, if you want to cultivate an attitude that'll lead you into torment, then don't be spiritually minded. It's not a magic thing to be spiritually minded, it's to mind the things that the Bible says we ought to while we're on this earth. That's all it is. Being spiritual is living like the New Testament said. That's all. It's enough, but that's all. Then they should be respectful of parents. I've already touched on that too. 
It is a shameful thing to be disobedient to your parents. I think that's carefully spelled out in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 2. Where Paul said to Timothy, men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boastful, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. Now I want you to look at this list in which he placed disobedient to parents. He put it right along with those who love their own selves, who are covetous, who are boastful, who are proud, who are blasphemers. And the other two are unthankful. Unholy. Holy means set apart by the way you live to be fit servants of God. Obedience, on the other hand, is what God requires because it's good for you and good for me. Colossians 3 and verse 20. You'll remember in your study of the crucifixion of Christ that our blessed Redeemer made provision even for his mother. I often think about that in observing the Lord's Supper. Our mind is to be upon uh, the body of Christ, when we partake of the bread, a body that knew no sin and thus could be offered on our behalf as a sacrifice for sins. Blood shed from that body also knew no sin, thus shed for the remission of our sins. Yet in the midst of dying on the cross, that was the reason that he was there for the remission of our sins. He would as Interesting sidelights say, John, behold thy mother. Mother, behold thy son. And from that day forward, John took his mother into his house, took care of her. That had nothing directly to do with why he was on that cross. Nothing. It had nothing to do with him dying for the remission of our sins but it had to do with showing the importance of the godliness that had been instilled in him through the teaching of his mother and all that had been around him. You say, oh, he's the son of God. He, he's God in the flesh. He was a human being just like we are when it comes to that. And he had to make himself do that. When you consider how he writhed in agony and pain and shame on that cross, when he could hardly speak, he said what he did to make sure his mother was taken care of. What is wrong with those kind of thoughts and attitudes, preparing a person to be that way? Well, we should do no less. As we grow older, we should continue to show loving respect and that involves financial concern for those who brought us into this world, took care of us, raised us, 1 Timothy 5, 8. No one has ever truly regretted being appreciated or appreciative and loving toward their mother and father. Then the other point is don't forget the parable of the talents has a lot to do when it comes to children being what they ought to be. We dare not violate the principle of bearing fruit as servants in the vineyard of the Lord. John 15, verse 8. Elders, teachers, preachers, and godly parents don't just happen. They are developed. Spiritual growth must take place and that which brings about spiritual growth. 2 Peter 3.18 There must be an attitude in our minds we must do our best. Now, your best may not be what somebody else's best may be, but individually according to our talents we do our best. Ecclesiastes 9 and verse 10 reads, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. Paul would say for those who obey the truth as Christians that it's God who works in you, Philippians 2.13. Do you want God to work in you? It's no amazing thing. Simply I honestly do what he said. And thus you will bring forth ultimately the great productive ability of your life and things that really matter 
and that will lead into eternity and abide eternity. But we must make the proper decisions. If not, we'll spend our energies on all sorts of things that will perish with using and will not get past this life. Then there's also this in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, something to remember. If we had our days to live over, most of us would steer clear of worldly companions and for a very good reason. Be not deceived. Evil companionships corrupt good morals. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. I can't say it any better than that. That's God speaking to members of the church. That doesn't mean you can't have acquaintances with people. After all, we try to uh, visit with folks with the idea of setting up a Bible study with them, but they don't become your bosom buddies, as we want to say. You don't involve yourself in all that they do because they're not godly. They're not Christians. They haven't obeyed the gospel. They're of this world. You know, when you think about it, brethren, there's only two kinds of people in this world as far as those who are accountable to God for their actions. Children of the devil and children of God. That's all. As 1 Corinthians 5, 6 also warns, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Thus, to use other terms from 1 Corinthians 7, 35, we should therefore serve the Lord without distraction. Everything in this world as God made it is good and wholesome. Yet if we involve ourselves in, I don't care what it is, I won't even use an example, just anything of this present world, to the point to where it causes us to neglect Bible study and prayer and doing the things the Lord wants the church to do, we're distracted. Young people in the church should marry faithful Christians, period. And then they'll have somebody to help them go to heaven. Somebody that will help in rearing these children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. It will help each other be pure in thought, word, and action. Philippians 4, 8, and so on. Where there is a constant loyalty to God. And where the standard of truth, the Bible, is constantly held up. So let us be sure to share these thoughts with young people. Let me say to our young people, why not take thoughts like this and talk to your friends about it? Wouldn't that be amazing? You have the courage to do that? You have the conviction to do it? And then to live it out before them? Over a century ago, Robert Browning urged older people to grant youth their heritage. Christians know the greatest heritage for any age is to know the joy of doing the will of heaven with the hope of everlasting life. You cannot live a better life than the Christian life. You cannot live a better life than living according to the authority of Christ as it's set out in the New Testament. And the quicker you can start doing that without distraction, then the better off you'll be. If you're not a child of God this morning, we urge you to begin at the beginning by believing with all of your heart that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, repenting of your sins, Acts 17, 30, confessing your faith in the Christ, Romans 10, 10, and being baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins, Acts 2.38, Galatians 3.27. As a child of God, is there any repenting that needs to be done? If so, now is the time to do it, confessing sins and praying for forgiveness. Let us resolve that we as the church will work with each one of us, children, parents, to make us all stronger, more mindful of living on the level that is spiritual. So come to the Lord if you need while we stand and while we sing.